and we have had many species watching over us. The Pleiadians are our cosmic parents. So when a planet ascends and human beings are on this ascension path where we're going to become an ascended planet. So the Pleiadians were involved in seeding life here and taking care of us and watching over us. The Octurians were the parents of the Pleiadians. And when I've heard about this new world of love that heaven is talking about, you know, um, we got a lot of help from above. Hello, David. A warm welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Yannicka. It's a pleasure to be here on Wisdom from the North. I'm really happy to have you on the show, David, because we're going to dive into some intriguing topics today, like our extraterrestrial heritage and connection. I know my audience is really interested in that, and I am as well. I've been curious about that ever since I was four years old. And you have an amazing background. You've studied near-death experiences, and you've studied over 700 of them uh, over a span of 14 years, and you were the author of God Took My Clothes. So I'm excited to dive deep today and I would love to hear your background like why did you start to research near-death experiences in the first place well it's actually something that goes back to my days as a Christian and I think it's in Proverbs it says sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways and that's exactly what it was um, I was a Christian living a good life working as an engineer in a fortune 500 company and Life was good, and then in 1999, I came down with chronic tendonitis that started in my hands, and then it went to my feet and jaw, and it caused severe disabilities, and there was times I couldn't do my job, and I became very depressed. Um, I even spent three years where I had to use a mobility scooter, and during that time, I had been prayed for by a dozen or so churches, hundreds of people, because, you know, I believe that you know, I ask and it's given, and and I came to a very painful conclusion because it was just getting worse. I wasn't getting healed, and I thought, well, one of two things was going on here: God doesn't exist, or more likely, He exists, but I'm not a good Christian. He's the son I'm embarrassed of. He doesn't like me, and you know, I've been bad, and that kind of thing. And I clicked on a YouTube video in 2007, and that was kind of in the worst part of my pain, my physical pain. And it was about an atheist who died, saw the afterlife and returned. And he didn't show any of the signs of lying. You know, I went through training because at, at, I worked in engineering sales, went through training about how to spot a lie and all of that. And he was genuine. Everything he displayed showed that he was being genuine. So I started looking into it and it just kind of snowballed. And before I knew it, I was writing a book and now I'm doing spiritual counseling for people who've had NDEs or OBEs or STEs and that kind of thing. So it's been quite a journey. Their experiences changed every aspect of my life. They really, by sharing their testimonies and being brave and sharing these, these near-death experiences, they saved my life. I mean, I have a joy and peace that I didn't think I'd ever have in life. So what are the commonalities, you would say, that you experience from these afterlife experiences? The commonalities, probably the biggest one would be that four beautiful four-letter word, love. They come back and they talk about the importance of love. You know, it's why we're here. It's what we're made of. It's what God's made of. So this unconditional love that's impossible to describe in human words, it's so different that, you know, they get to that part of the testimony where they talk about the love of heaven and they just can't describe it. They can't convey it to us. It's ineffable. It just can't be described in human words. They, you know, some of them try with analogies, you know, imagine the strongest love you've ever felt multiplied by 500 or a thousand. And that's what it feels like. So that's the big one. The second would be that we are immortal beings. We are little facets of God. So we have always existed. We always will. Uh, that there's an afterlife, that we take on many different roles. We play these games down here and incarnate in the physical life. And then there's a lot of after effects. So they come back as completely different people. So a lot of them go through a marital status change. Um, if the marriage does survive, it continues in a completely different way because they're a different person. They come back less materialistic and more altruistic, whatever they were pursuing before, whether it was a, a career or a hobby or, you know, a certain activity, 
that takes a back seat to having meaningful, loving relationships and making a contribution to humanity. And so, for instance, one man who was a police officer became a high school teacher. Another guy who was a billionaire gave up all his ties to the financial industry and became a, a counselor, a family counselor. Another man involved in organized crime uh, became a, a counselor for, uh, for teenagers and young people who were involved in crime. So there's just a, a transformative change that happens to people when they find out the truth and the nature of who we are. And it's quite beautiful. What is that NDE story that really stands out for you, uh, that amazed you after having, you know, researched so many of them? Which one did really stand out? Well, for me, the most special one was Howard Storm. It was the video I clicked on back in 2007. Uh, YouTube was fairly new, and it was hard to find, you know, near-death experience testimonies on YouTube. And now there's there's channels like Wisdom from the North that you've been doing this for 10 years. I mean, they're all over the place. And his testimony really touched me because he was an atheist, and he would angrily yell at people, you know, who are Christians and tell them they're crazy and delusional and all this. And when he got to the afterlife, he realized, oh, there is something afterwards. And he had been sort of a tyrant, you know, one of these people that's screaming and slamming their fist on tables when they get mad, they intimidate everybody. There's one in every big corporation or organization, even in churches, you know, there's somebody like that. And so when he was being brought towards heaven, he, he felt, you know, bad. He felt, you know, I'm garbage filth. You know, I don't deserve to be in this good place that I'm seeing. And Jesus turned to him and said, well, you know, we don't make mistakes. You belong here with us. And it was that moment of, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do down there. We want you to succeed and, and, and help with the creation process and always choose the path, path of love. But we love you no matter what. You're accepted. You're loved. You know, you're not bad. And that was just probably the most beautiful thing just to, to see how he transformed. And that's probably the most special experience. And he had a very long conversation up there. You know, there's no time in the afterlife. So he was only dead a few minutes. And he said his question and answer period with Jesus, and he was with about seven or eight angels, uh, lasted longer than his college degree. And this guy had a doctorate. <laughs> so it was a special testimony, completely transformed his life. And that was the testimony that got me started to transform my life. Right. Now, I've uh, interviewed a lot of people having near-death experiences, I think maybe around 30. And what I, my sort of takeaway is from it is that, or one of the takeaways is that the afterlife or the experience they have, it's influenced by their belief system. So I just interviewed a lady who had a hellish experience and she said it was because I really thought I was going to hell. Like if I kissed the guy, I was going to hell. If I ate wrong food, I was going to hell. That was her belief system. And then I'm curious about an atheist, you know, who believes they're nothing. Wouldn't it then be pitch dark for a long, long time? Well, not necessarily. Um, heaven creates an environment for the person having the near-death experience that will help them the most. But the beliefs also do affect it because one of the things I hear over and over again from near-death experiences is that thoughts are things. And in heaven, it happens very quickly. And down here, it's a long, drawn-out process. But many atheists found themselves in the heavenly environment and were surprised. And I really don't believe in atheists. You know, I, I had a guy, I was at this art and music festival uh, once called Burning Man, and this person was reading my book. And another guy said, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that. And I said, well, that's okay. I, I don't believe in atheists. <laughs> he said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, nobody in any religion or any spiritual endeavor sees the whole of God. We only see little pieces. And you believe in love, don't you? And he says, yeah. And I says, well, I think that that's part of God. So, and I, the other thing I'll tell an atheist is, is we have two things in common. Uh, we both believe the same thing, just reversed. So you believe we're human beings pretending there's a God. I believe we're little facets of God pretending to be human. <laughs> and the other thing we both hope is that, you know, if we're honest, we both hope that you're wrong. <laughs> so, uh, uh -huh. and people, there's agnostics. I mean, my father isn't sure about the afterlife. He doesn't believe in all the stuff I talk about. But, you know, he listens to Teal Swan, who you've had on the show several times. And he incorporates into his life 
almost every spiritual aspect. And he is probably doing a better job than I am in his personal interactions, choosing the path of love. So you don't have to believe in anything to really be part of the creation process. And we choose the path of love. That's the creation process. And children don't have any spiritual knowledge at all, zero. And yet they are the most spiritually mature of, of any group. You know, if you're in a in a public place and you're having a bad day, you know, walk up to a, a a room full of adults and say, "I'm having a really bad day. I need a hug from somebody." They're probably going to look at you like crazy. You're crazy. You walk into a room of children and say that you're going to get hugs. Yeah. So it doesn't take belief to be part of this process. Yeah, and probably deep down, like deep, 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 deep down, like you're saying, they're having a belief maybe that uh, colors their afterlife experience. Um, so what have these NDE experiences and stories taught you about our connection with extraterrestrials? We hear a lot about the Pleiadians especially, and I'm curious about, uh, are there intelligent species within our galaxy, or are we talking other universes in our solar system? Like, what is your experience of there being intelligent lives around outside Earth. Well, you know, Albert Einstein once said, two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> so let's talk for a moment about the universe and how big it is. So if you were to travel at the speed of light, you could go around the Earth seven times in one second, roughly. And traveling at this tremendous speed of light, if you were to try and cross the pinpoint of light in this universe that we call the Milky Way galaxy, you would have to travel at that tremendous speed 24 hours a day, seven days a week for your entire life, and then repeat that for 1,200 lifetimes. So our galaxy contains hundreds of billions of stars, and it's just a pinpoint, and there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. You know, if we were alone in the universe, uh, it, it'd be way overbuilt, <laughs> and God is not that inefficient. And so one of the common questions that people ask when they're in heaven is, are we alone in the universe? And the answer is always the same. You know, it's kind of almost funny to ask that, and they know the universe is full of life, and there are other dimensions with other universes that are also full of life. And so, yes, there are, I, I'll talk of only about this galaxy because I haven't heard much about other galaxies, but each galaxy is different. They all have different laws of physics, and this galaxy is working on a love fear duality. It is full of life. About 95% of the intelligent species are benevolent or sort of neutral and peaceful. And there's 5% that are kind of misbehaving. But because of their limited consciousness, their technology is limited. So the 95% kind of keep them in check. And we have had many species watching over us. The Pleiadians are our cosmic parents. So when a planet ascends and human beings are on this ascension path where we're going to become an ascended planet, their job becomes to seed life on another planet. So the Pleiadians were involved in seeding life here and taking care of us and watching over us. The Octurians were the parents of the Pleiadians. And when I've heard about this new world of love that heaven is talking about, you know, um, we got a lot of help from above, not just heaven, but also extraterrestrials, the Pleiadians um, in specifically. And of course, if you see a flying saucer, it's not Pleiadian. You know, they have camouflage. I mean, we, our military is developing pretty good camouflage right now. So they will eventually show themselves. We're not ready to meet them yet. You know, if you had moved into a new neighborhood and the neighbors told you, yeah, I see that guy across the street over there. He spends half of his income on military equipment and guns and you know all sorts of stuff. And if you show up at his door and he doesn't know you, he's not going to be pointing a gun at you, but he's going to have it at his side ready, you know, because he, he doesn't trust you. Well, I just described with that neighbor, the United States government, right? Half their money on military. And if a spaceship landed on the White House lawn, would they be met with handshakes and smiles or would they be, there be a military response? We're not ready yet, but we will meet them someday when we're ready. 
All right. So I would love to go into more details. Uh, you're saying that the Pleiadians were seeding us and the Arcturians were seeding them again. And uh, then I think about uh, Egypt and the Sumerians, and they were speaking about the Anunnaki's, and they have some pictures, you know, of uh, spaceships, etc. Uh, so um, would you, okay, they are seeding us. Does that mean they're are they us basically in the future or are they our parents? And when did this seeding start? What did that start during the Sumerian times? I'm not clear on the details and exactly what all that entails, seeding life on another planet. I do know that it was a few hundred thousand years ago and I just don't have details about it, but I've heard about the Anunnaki. There are many species that visited the planet. Uh, we've had about a dozen that visit on a regular basis and several hundred that have visited now and then. And I don't really have a clear understanding of how that entire process works. I do know that Earth is the only free will planet in this galaxy. You only need one, just like you only need one big cancer research lab on Earth because when they come up with a cure for a kind of cancer, they share it with the rest of, of the planet. Well, You've got to have somebody experiencing the fear, love, duality. Now, when I say free will, I don't mean that, you know, the rest of the galaxy doesn't have freedom. Freedom is different. But we are not aware of our common connection. And that allows us free will. So what I mean by that is, let's say you've got a dog and you're connected to the dog. Whatever the dog experiences, you experience. Whatever you experience, the dog experiences it. Well, you can't decide to kick the dog. I mean, you're going to feel it. So that's not an option. But if you're disconnected from the dog, you can decide to kick the dog or, or pet the dog. And every time you make the choice of love, it, it helps the creation process. And then the rest of the galaxy learns from that. And that turns into the rest of the universe learning. And that's part of the fractal of growth of God. So it's a very critical part. And of course, this creation process has been going on for a long time. I heard about you know, the very first one where they tried to seed life um, presumably from another galaxy. I don't know the details. And the first two times it failed, and the third time they made it. So luckily, we're going to make it this time around here on Earth. All right. So uh, these Pleiadians, they're in our galaxy, right? That's what you said. Oh, yes. Yes. I don't, I don't believe that they are a future version of us. Okay. But they, they've had technology for several million years, you know, we've had it for a couple of hundred. They're very advanced, very benevolent. They look like us. If you saw a Pleiadian, you'd think they were Nordic. You know, they're very uh, sort of fair skin, blonde hair. Is that and true? Like, or is that just a myth? It's really true? I believe so, yes. I know there are planets. There's many planets in the Pleiades. But uh, I think the main one there, it's colder than Earth. So, of course, we're very special to them. And they've been through what we've been through. You know, they went through their times of war and conflict and disconnection and you know environmental problems you know, they've, they've all gone through that before so they know what they're doing just like a parent you know i've been through childhood and i i can help you out here so sure they're watching over us they they love us very much they and just like a parent they'll they'll get frustrated you know sometimes the parents get frustrated with their two-year-old but the maturing takes a very long time and they're aware of that so they're looking after us now the grays i've heard there's a, a species of the greys, according to Bashar, channeled by Daryl Anka. They are a future version of us in an alternate reality that came back and they need the genetics from us to kind of heal their biology. And so there's things like that going on. And I've only heard from three near-death experiences, verification of our scientists' multiverse theory that there are lots of different parallel realities and so forth. So apparently that theory is true, which blew my mind. <laughs> I was quite surprised. Wow. Is there such a thing as a, a galactic federation? Have you heard of that? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm laughing because this really confused me when I first started hearing about the Pleiadians. They were talking about a galactic federation of worlds, and they have transporter technology and replicators, and they have a prime directive where they're not supposed to interfere with you know, developing planets and they'll, until they become spacefaring planets where they can travel. And I'm going, guys, you're not even making up a good lie that this is Star Trek, right? <laughs> well, it's unclear. It took me a while to look into this, like, wait a minute. Uh, 
It's unclear exactly what happened, but I suspect from stuff I've seen on the internet, I have not heard this from a near-death experiencer or a trans channeler, that Gene Roddenberry met a Pleiadian. And then in the 1950s, he was part of a group of Pleiadian trans channelers. And I actually read what somebody posted on the internet, some notes from that group. And they talked about the, the Prime Directive and the Galactic Federation of Worlds and all that. So, you know, it's kind of be funny when they show up and start talking about all this. People, you know, this, this is Star Trek. What am I cra going crazy? <laughs> well, no, it's the, Star Trek was based on some real stuff. Right. Yeah, I believe a lot of filmmakers know what they're doing, and I think they're sort of channeling a lot of this information. Yes, I've what often art, for instance, uh -huh. Steven Spielberg. <laughs> I was yeah. so fond of uh, his series, Taken. He's tapping into something there, for sure. Oh, yeah. I, I've always suspected from the things I see on TV, there's some subconscious or spiritual awareness of reality. I mean, Stargate Atlantis, they get a lot of things right. You know, they talk about zero-point energy, and I've heard that that's going to be our future of energy. These little yeah. boxes about the size of a microwave that just run for 50, 100 years and produce free energy using quantum-based energy. Yeah. All right. So the so the Pleiadians are sort of protecting us and helping us. So so where are we going as a humanity? Uh, I mean, are is the goal to become more like them, to to wake up? Where 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 are we going as a humanity if that has come through your experience with ex uh, yeah, with um ND stories? Well, there's always a process of maturing as a species. Uh, we're not teenagers, we're not adults here right now, we're like the two-year-old who's oh. misbehaving uh, and the babysitter never knows what he's going to do next, you know, and we misbehave and we also do some amazing things. You know, children will do that. They'll do something, you know, break something you, and you think, I, I can't believe you did that. How could you do that? And then the next minute they'll do something amazing that, you know, good, that amazes you. And that's kind of where we are. So we're just learning not to fight each other in the sandbox. So for thousands and thousands of years, the norm was this. It's a hostile world. You have to fight to survive. You have to compete to survive. And so you would attach yourself to a group, whether it was a city or an army or a country or something as big as the Roman Empire, and you made yourself as strong as possible. And then by force, you know, root chakra battle, war, oppression or whatever, you took from others to survive. Well, we are in a new paradigm and we haven't quite waken up to the fact that we don't have to fight each other anymore. With our technology, with our ability to mass manufacture, with everything we know, with our cooperation, I mean, think about this, you know, this smartphone. That took millions of people cooperating to make. With all that technology we have, the new paradigm, which we haven't woken up to yet as a species, is that there is enough for everyone. And the new paradigm is we are not separate. We are connected. When you harm one person, you harm the whole. When you help one person, when you bring hope or joy to just one soul, millions or billions receive the vibration. And as we come into that new consciousness of realizing, hey, we're a family, we're not warring tribes, we're a family and we need to cooperate, there's going to be a massive change here on Earth. And we're only about five decades away from peace on Earth, and there's going to be some chaos before then. You know, there's going to be some rough times, we're going to have a few storms come and go, we'll survive it, but we are right in the big transition the great awakening where we are moving towards this new world of love, where people are going to live in small communities of around 100, 150 people. The entire society will be focused on teaching children about love and science and nature and God. And we will live in, live in peace and harmony with each other and with the environment. We will be able to communicate telepathically and have friendships with people on other planets. There won't be much of a need for technology. Oh, well, we'll have technology and spaceships and things like that and, and you know, artificial intelligence and, and all sorts of things to help us, but we'll live very naturally, sort of more like indigenous tribes uh, used to live. And 
it's just going to be a different place. And then, of course, when we become that planet, which we're about 150 years away from that, uh, then our job will become to seed life on another planet, and they'll be doing the, the free will test of love and fear. And so, you know, if you look at the mainstream news media, it looks like everything's falling apart. You know, there's a common phrase I hear or idea from near-death experiencers, and that is there's a perfect divine plan of creation, and it's working itself out in this perfection. Well, when you turn on the six o'clock news, it, it sure doesn't seem like that. And that's because we have a society that's focused on negativity. And there's a lot of beauty in the world, and there's a lot of horrible things going on. And if we focus on the good things that are going on, well, that's going to grow because human beings are creator gods and we get more of what we focus on. So we're just starting to see this change. You know, the Good News Network. Uh, there's a YouTube channel talking about uh, faith in humanity restored where they're showing positive things. I mean, you go on YouTube and it's mostly accidents and conflict and you know bad news. And the good stuff is, is a minority and that's going to change. And this change that's going to happen on planet Earth is so transformational that if an alien were to show up today that had never been here and looked around, he would say, yeah, you guys are a mess. You're fighting each other. You're warring each other. You're trashing your environment. Uh, your technology has far exceeded your, your level of consciousness. You're not going to make it. And then if that same alien came back 150 years from now, his jaw would drop. What did these people do? Oh, my God, they really cleaned up their act. They made this place into a garden paradise. How did they do that so fast? That's where we are. My, oh, my. That's a huge transformation. How, how is that possible? And, and is that something that you've heard from all those who have been in the afterlife, that they're saying this, that, that they're predicting the future? No, not all of them. It's a very select few that are shown the future. So I'm going to say... If I were to take all the people that contributed bits and pieces to that idea, I would say less than 50. But it is an idea that is talked about by, you know, Pleiadian trans channelers and all sorts of other trans channelers and spiritual gurus on this planet. And, you know, many people who have natural psychic abilities. And, you know, it's, it's just overwhelming evidence. I have no doubt that that's where it's going. Oh, wow. That's amazing. I mean, just 150 years, we can almost experience it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you will. You'll be back. You know, you, most of the human beings on this planet, we're, uh, we're experts at transforming planets just like this one into, you know, garden paradises. That's what we do. And we're considered sort of the daredevil souls by the, by the people in heaven. You know, we come down to these places that are all messed up and we incarnate. And most of the human beings on this planet have been uh, coming down here for a long time, many lifetimes. They've been working on this goal. They don't want to miss the grand finale. Most of us listening to this are going to be back, you know, to see the grand finale. So you'll get to see it if not in this, yeah, if not in this life, in the next one, sure. Oh, my, oh, my. That's exciting. Uh Okay, yeah, it makes sense because I really feel like there's a massive awakening going on and especially, you know, with all our technology and YouTube and everything, we these ideas are spread much faster. But at the same time, then we see the war in Ukraine and we're like, okay, uh, but like you're saying, two steps forward and one step back. So there's going to be some turmoil as well uh, before it gets better. All right, so... Uh, could you say something about the, the journey of the soul, what you've learned? Like, how detailed do we plan our lives uh, before we come here? Because we do have this free will. And I didn't know that we were the only planet that had free will. That's quite amazing. So I assume that a lot of souls will be very excited to come down to this planet to, you know, rehearse this free will. But... Uh, in your experience, how detailed uh, is our blueprint uh, for our lives when we incarnate? Well, you don't plan what you were going to have for breakfast this morning on this time and date. It's like a vacation itinerary. So I've heard the process described many times. You sit down with some elders and wise people and your soul group. You might call them a council of elders. You might have heard about them. And you pick a life. So you choose your parents, you choose the various roles, and these soul groups will do just 
something very similar to what children do when they play their games, you know, cowboys and Indians. All right, well, you're going to be the Indian or cops and robbers. You know, we used to play that when I was a kid and you play different roles and the major events are set. So a big event like a nasty divorce or chronic pain that I had, that was something I planned. And then the details are filled in. And there's some people who will say, well, this is control. They're controlling us. No, <laughs> we, we chose this and it's not control you can always deviate from the itinerary. But it's pretty rare that you plan a vacation to Europe you know, for a month and you get there and you say, well, I don't like this place. I, I'm going to, the, to Tahiti. You can do it. It happens on, on rare occasions, but most people stick to the plan and, and then the, all the details are filled in. So from your experience, uh, when we're incarnating, incarnating um, are we incarnating to the planet again and again, or have you seen that the souls that you have studied or the people you've studied, that they have been other places, that they, for example, back to the Arcturians and Palladians, that they have been experiencing being other life species, uh, life forms? Uh, or is it sort of like when you incarnate on Earth, you're, you're doing that again and again uh, for an amount of time, even though there is no time, but you're more connected to Earth in a way in your soul evolution. Yeah, you, you don't start here. It, this is too tough of a place for a, a new soul without experience. So if you imagine a new driver, you, know, you could put me in a car with bad brakes, sloppy steering, you know, not very good visibility, no rear view mirror, and I wouldn't get in an accident. You put a brand new driver in that car and they're going to crash it. So a brand, a, a newer soul that's just beginning their journey of incarnating into physical, physical existences has to start out on a planet that's advanced, like the Plea Pleiadians or the Arcturians, oh. Syrians. And then once you get used to it, you kind of slowly build up and you eventually, if you get to where the people listening to this uh, video are right now, an expert. So you don't send a child who just learned how to walk on a trek up Mount Everest. They're going to die. That's for experienced hikers. Earth is the most difficult planet in this galaxy in which to have an incarnation. It's the third most difficult in the universe. And it's such a big learning experience. A lot of souls want to come here. But for every 100 souls that wants to come here because of its huge jump in consciousness and growth, there's only a body for one. So it's a privilege to be here. Oh, it's tough. You know, climbing Mount Everest is tough, but, you know, there's going to be suffering. It's part of the process. We don't come here to suffer. That's not our purpose. Just like, you know, if you ask the people who climb Mount Everest, what was the main reason you did it? They're not going to say, oh, I wanted to suffer more. But if you ask every one of them, did you know you were going to suffer and it was going to be hard? Oh, yeah. Souls know the potentials when they come down here. They know this could happen and that could happen. They're shown their life plans and all the things that could happen. And they are willing participants in all that. So in reality, there are no victims. And the souls that incarnate here, many of them have been doing it for a long time. They are experts at planet Earth. And they're getting better with each, each incarnation. And all those souls, you know, like you, who are coming back over and over again, are getting really good at it. And that's helping us push the whole planet into this new world of love that's coming. Wow, I've never heard that. Uh, I thought it was the other way around, sort of that we are becoming species like the Pleiadians, the Nocturians, and all these higher intelligences, not that we started out there. Wow, yeah, we, we, we will become like them from the planetary standpoint, but then when you've got an easier planet, that's for newer, less experienced souls because you know you don't you don't need to be experienced to... You know, if I'm going on a 10 minute walk, I don't need to be a, an expert mountain climber. That's not necessary for the job. So yeah. souls are placed in the planets where they'll, they'll best fit in and good for the tasks they want to accomplish. But do you think a soul can be several places at the same time that I could live on the Pleiades at the, Pleiades at the same time being Janneke here? Or is that uh, that's, exactly, that's exactly what we do. So, oh. you know, Sometimes when I talk about this stuff on these YouTube channels and radio shows and so forth, I'll get comments. Oh, that guy's not all here. They're correct. <laughs> We're not all here. When you become such a, a big chunk of energy, for lack of a better term, 
you cannot incarnate to a human body. It would burn it up. So only a portion of you separates and comes down here. So we are multidimensional beings. From our physical perspective, we have the life we're living right now, and then our past lives, and then we're going to have some future lives, and maybe on other planets and other places. But from our soul's perspective, they're all happening simultaneously. So that's why you get things like, you know, a five-year-old child who just you know, picks up a guitar and within weeks is just playing great music. Well, that's coming from their multidimensional aspects of their soul. And a lot of our likes and dislikes come from that. So like there was one guy who he hated the cold and he just couldn't stand cold environments, didn't like being cold, you know, he liked liked it warm. Well, when he had his near-death experience, he was shown that he had a lifetime as a courier in this mountainous region that was always cold. And he spent his whole lifetime outdoors, traveling from one place to another, delivering messages, and was cold for his entire life. So he didn't like the cold. You know, and a lot of our talents come from that too. I know that I was a teacher on the, in the Pleiades. The first word I ever spoke was bata. And I didn't remember this, my parents told me. And they'd say, well, what does that mean? And I would just repeat the word, bata, bata. And of course, that faded away as I grew. And later on, I was watching a special about the Pleiadians. And this man was talking about uh, so and so was a Pleiadian teacher, and his name is Bata. And I went, oh, wow. Whoa. Because I'd been told by some of my interviewees before I started talking about NDEs publicly, oh, you're a teacher. And of course, I found out that that's what my talent is. And both my parents are teachers. So yeah, <laughs> multidimensional beings, and we have lots of lives in lots of different places simultaneously. Interesting. So what is your perspective on then uh, a young soul and an older soul? Because you said that, you know, some of us are huge. That's why we split into different realities and experiences but are there such a thing as a young soul and does are there young souls being born all the time like <laughs> how does this work if you know anything about that when a tree grows are there young and older parts of the tree sort of but not really you know the leaves are new but they grew from the tree. You can't really divide it up into boxes. So, and you can't really give it an age because there's no time in the afterlife. That's a very common theme. There's no time up there. So a person could be dead for 30 seconds and you know they have an experience that's longer than a lifetime. But let's call it more mature or more developed. And so, yes, there are souls that are in different stages of development. And there's this giant fractal of God that's growing, just like a tree grows, and a tree is a fractal. So you get a trunk, and it splits into branches, and it grows and develops. And as that tiny little sapling grows into a big tree, the big tree has many different parts. Are they new? Well, yes and no. And they're all part of that little sapling, but then they're also, you know, new in a way from our 3D perspective. So that's that's probably kind of a tough one for us to understand from our, our limited 3D brain. But the way I understand it is we are all different facets of God. So when you are part of the universal consciousness, prime creator, God, whatever you want to call, call it, and you are aware of the whole, there is no individuality. But you can limit your consciousness to one little part of that fractal, just like you can look at a, a, a big city from an airplane above and see it all. But then if you go down to one particular place on the street, you're going to have a very unique perspective. And if you spend time there, you're going to learn things and change based on that unique perspective. And that's what we're doing as souls. We're limiting our consciousness coming down here. We're looking at creation and at God and at all the other little facets of creation from a unique perspective. You know, when you're that person standing on that street, you can look around at other parts of the city, but it's going to be a different perspective. And because it's a different perspective, you grow and learn in unique ways. And that's kind of a decent analogy to describe what's going on with creation and, and our part in it. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious, how has all this changed you after you started uh, researching all these stories? How has it changed you and your spiritual practice and you as a person? Well, it's done a couple of things that were unpleasant. One of them was I was a Christian most of my life from age 14 until I'm going to say about five years into the NDE research. And it was great being part of that community. And I don't have that strong community anymore. And I've got nothing against Christianity. I think they're a very good religion. They're focused on love. I believe that just as a, a bee will take pollen from different flowers, a wise person will take a sense of goodness from every religion. But the changes, the positive changes have far outweighed the negative. You know, I get called crazy and delusional and things like that. And, and I'm getting used to it to not let it bother me. But the positive ones have been... Well, how do I put it into words? They, they say, these people sharing their testimony saved my life. They completely transformed me. I'm not scared of dying anymore. That's number one. I mean, if a person points a gun at my head, I'm not, I'm not scared at all. If they point it at my stomach, I'm going to be terrified because I'll survive and it's going to hurt like, <laughs> like crazy. Um, you know, COVID came along. I didn't have a, a moment's fear. I felt bad for everybody else who, you know, was terrified of this. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll either not catch it or I catch it and recover or I go home to this beautiful place. I mean, there was no downside. It has brought a peace to my life that is so profound. It's, it's hard to describe. I didn't know this level of peace was possible to know that, wait a minute, I don't have to feel guilty about all the bad things I've done. You know, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be judged. I'm not going to be punished. I'm not in danger of being burned in hell because I didn't obey. And that was a huge weight off my shoulders. And then, of course, just in my daily life, you know, when I, when I was in a bad mood before, everybody knew it. I mean, I would be coldly cordial. And if somebody crossed me or was mildly rude, I let loose. And now, you know, I still have my down days. I still have days where I wake up and I'm just not happy with the world and, and being here on planet Earth. It's natural when you're hiking Mount Everest to go, oh, I just want to be done with this. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but now I realize that every word I speak, every interaction with, that I have with another human being has an effect, good or bad. And that every time I choose to be kind and loving, especially when I'm in a bad mood, that contributes to the process of creation. You know, I've heard from near-death experience, there's, there's no way that the universe could possibly unfold and grow if every individual soul didn't fulfill their purpose. We will all fulfill our purpose, and we're all really important. And so I always thought you had to do something great. You had to do something magnificent. You know, you had to be a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs or, or something like that. And you don't. Um, Mother Teresa said, we can't all do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And so every little act of unconditional love is, is huge to heaven. And they actually cheer for us. Like we cheer at a football game, you know, when our team makes a goal. When a human being surprises heaven and we think they're going to do some horrible thing and they, they get in, you know, influence by their guides or angels or whatever, or they just make the decision to do something good. And and maybe it's a big thing. They cheer up there. People have heard this cheer. You know, when a drug addict gives it up and starts deciding to to lead a better life and reconnect with his family, they cheer for us. It's changed it's even changed the way I view politics and and business and and corporations and religion, everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for all the people who freely shared their testimonies. Oh, wow. So inspiring and beautifully shared. I have some questions that I ask uh, my guests. My first one is, what is self-love to you? Self-love. So that's selfishness. So there's altruism and selfishness, and selfishness is a dirty word in our culture, and not because there's anything wrong with it. So if we are all connected, which we are, and I do things for myself, then it helps the whole because we're all connected. Now, if I'm altruistic and I do things to help humanity, that's good for me because we're all connected. But what we have is a planet out of balance. We have a minority of people who are 
altruistic and they're getting burnt out because they're minority. You know, they're giving too much of themselves and being out of balance there is, is just as bad as the selfishness. But the out of control selfishness is causing a lot of problems. So no right or wrong in that equation, but we need to bring the planet back in balance. You know, the, the heart surgeon who works 120 hours a week and then you know, has a nervous breakdown from stress is no good to anybody. You got to have balance. So there's nothing what wrong with treating yourself with love and, and thinking about yourself first. Nothing wrong with it. And what is happiness to you? Happiness. I think happiness is a connection to the energy of love. You know, so many times we're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, or we're angry about what happened yesterday. And happiness is when you forget all that and just appreciate the joy of the moment. One of my favorite Larson cartoons, Larson, for those of you who don't know, made these uh, funny cartoons back in the, I think it was the 80s and 90s. And one of my favorite ones is, it's a picture of hell. And there's these two de demons standing there and they, you know, they're dressed up like almost like Halloween costume demons. They're not scary demons. And they got their pitchforks and there's these human beings shoveling coal and there's fire and brimstone and everybody's sweating and miserable. And this one guy's got a wheelbarrow full of these rocks and he's walking along and he's sweating like everybody else. And he's walking along whistling. And the one demon is saying to the other, you know, we're just not reaching that guy. And that's the way we're supposed to face our trials and tribulations in difficult times. And I, and I like to I talk about uh, this guy, Mooney, who used to do model trains. And he would spend years making these beautifully detailed model trains. He's got a museum in Ohio. And he spent two years making this model train out of wood that had this spring-loaded mechanism, you know, to make it go around the track. And he worked on it for a couple of years, and he's got his family and friends there to, to show him this. And the, the mechanism that regulated the spring so that it slowly released the energy went around the track, broke, and it went off the track, smashed into the wall in a million pieces, two years of work gone. And as his family and friends stood there with their jaws, you know, Mooney is laughing. And they said, Mooney, why are you laughing? And he said, I've had my first train wreck. <laughs> and that's how we're supposed to face our, our lives down here and really enjoy the good times and the bad times, do our best to find joy. Yeah. I don't always succeed at that. It's tough to do, but we're capable of it. And what is the deeper meaning of life from your perspective? It's all about love. It's all about having a choice and choosing love. It's a process of creation that's been going on for a very long time. If the infinite creator was limited the the creator would not be infinite so there has to always be a tiny little pinpoint where period, people are experiencing the opposite of what we want and that opposite is fear and we suffer all the manifestations of it here on planet earth but it is all about love especially when we're having a bad day or especially with people who our ego judges don't deserve it we manage to love those people Oh, that's a big thing to heaven. You know, love your enemies. That's a Christian thing that I, I've kept with me. That's a solid idea, right in line with near-death experiencers. It's all about love. Beautiful. How can people find you, David? And what do you offer? Well, I have a book, God Took My Clothes, that's sort of a spirituality 101 for near-death experiences. And it talks about our purpose here, a little bit about the future. Um, everything that's going on on earth right now and what near-death experiencers teach us. And that's at godtookmyclothes.com. And of course, the book may not be for you. So there's a two chapter preview you can download. And if you're a Spanish speaker, you can download the whole thing for free. And then I have spiritual counseling services for people who are going through a spiritual awakening or they've had out-of-body experiences or just have questions. And I have a program for uh, people with financial hardships. And uh, that's how people can contact me. My, my uh, email and uh, scheduling is there on the website. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for this conversation, for coming to the show and all the best with your wonderful work. Well, thank you so much for inviting me here. It was a pleasure being on Wisdom from the North. And thank you for watching, guys. Much light from the US and Norway. Bye-bye.